Now the keen eyed amongst you will have noticed that this issue of BRM is entirely focused on preserved railways. And of course, what better way to present the DVD than from a station like here at Bewdley on the Seven Valley Railway, one of the UK's premier heritage lines. So, weather outside is perfect, but it was also a great day when I went to visit Ian Mellers and his layout for Gig East. Hello, my name's Ian Mellers, I'm the owner of Four Gig East. It's an O-gauge uh, heritage railway um, set in the present day. It's um, all scratch-built um, track, and most of all the buildings and everything are all uh, hand-built um, from car construction kits. It's completely DCC operated, um, including the signals and the points. They're all operated from the handset using uh, Merg circuit boards. Uh, all inter interconnected. Yeah, I'm a I'm an electronics nut at heart, and uh, it, it just had to be done. I'm particularly pleased with the, the camping coach. Um, a lot of effort went into that. Um, I wanted to get that as a main feature at the, at the front of the layout, so that uh, people have got something to look at other than the trains and the track and everything. And you know the the, um, the roof comes off, and they've got a full interior in there, um, all generally built up from uh, American Dolls House furniture actually. Uh, but I had to import it most of it because you just can't get it in this country. There's a, even a flat screen TV in there. There's a man sat in a, in a chair watching Teletubbies, but you you can't see that unless you're looking at it from the back of the layout. But uh, yeah, I like to put little little touches in there like that. Yeah. The track work really is. I'm I really still really chuffed with the track work. I, I, lo I love you know, this point here. Everyone thinks that well, that's a straight run there, but it isn't. If you if you line it, if you get down there, you can see it's actually a, a, a Y. There's a there's not a straight line in the, in that point, and you can't do that with proprietary you know uh, off the shelf products. You know you uh, you've got to hand build your track if you to get that sort of prototypical flow. And uh, yeah, really pleased with the track work. It all started because I bought this, I had a, an urge to do O-Gage, um, my, my, my other layout, Summit Colliery, is, is, is OO, industrial, um, set in 1958 very specifically, but I'd always had this urge to do O-Gage, and um, I, I, I just had a chance to buy off RM Web. Um, someone was selling this little pug, and it was in a in a bit of a bit of a state. It, it did run, it, yeah. But um, I bought that really, really cheaply. And at the same time, um, I, um, Ian Morton, uh, uh, he, he had got a few bits and pieces that he was he was selling off, and I bought a couple of point kits from him, one or two other bits and pieces, or actually that coach kit as well. Um, and it all kind of came together really at that point and the, the whole layout really started off just as a as a small demonstration yeah the whole layout really it started off as a small demonstration um, layout which was it was only two foot well one and a half foot by four foot and that platform was was here and there was a footbridge over there and I was gonna have a mirror to give you the rest of the the rest of the layout. It was only really just to have something to run the little loco on. I really didn't think that a small branch line terminus with a you know with a goods yard would be that entertaining at a at a show. I, I've, I've always resisted it, um, not thinking there'd be enough to keep you know keep you entertained. We had a, had a really good weekend, and as I was looking at down it, I thought actually I've got that bit there, and if I just make another board, and and, and it kind of grew from there really. And I, I laid it all out on on template, bought a load more track components from um, Markway up in Sheffield and just carried on. I mean, the, this, a lot of the point work was built as a track building demo at, uh, at, at a Mans one of the Mansfield shows that I, I helped run. 
Um, so it was, it, it's kind of evolved the whole layout in front of the general public. Everything is powered from the DCC bus. So I've only got, this is literally two wire into the layout. Um, I use the um, toggle fasteners that hold the board to get the, the boards together to get the power from one, one board to, to the other. And that was really why I wanted everything powered by the DCC bus. Mm. All this train activity is making me hungry. I think it's time we got the barbecue on. So there you have it, that's Ian Meller's layout for Gig East. And of course this really is what summer's all about, being outside, making the most of the weather for the barbecue, good company. But there is one thing that attracted my attention on the layout and that was this little chap here. So Ian, I mean, I know it's a bit of a laugh and a bit of fun, but yeah. tell us, yeah. what, what is it? Well, it's uh, Pete Harvey's um, kit of uh, the uh, famous uh, Welsh cartoon Engine I've or the engine from a kids TV show that was uh, running well, well, well certainly when I was a kid anyway before so. my time I well, no, uh, <laughs> almost certainly if you don't recognize him no, then uh, no, you weren't I, there no, Thomas the Tank Engine was, <laughs> was all I had when I was growing up but so what is it a kit it is yeah it's a sheet metal um, etch brass kit uh, folds up really really nicely there's a few there's a few bits of uh, resin on there the, um, the the chimney and the dome and the whistles are actually um, lost wax, okay. brass yep. cast. But um, yeah, the majority of the construction is, mm. is, is from flat sheet. Yeah. Mm. Now, of course, what Ian hasn't actually said is that, um, well, it's DCC equipped, and I'm sure you'll be able to give us a quick demonstration of some of the sounds that this little fellow can. So, lots of little sound effects are again taken from him. So we've got his, we've got his famous. Whistles and uh, noises, but we've also got some uh, some of the theme tunes and things like that also from the oh, okay. from the series. So I can again on the on the function buttons, I can just uh, I can just run up say say this one, and we've got the sort of theme tune music from the show. So there you have it, Ian Mellor's layout for Gig East. A little bit of a laugh as well. And we'll, if you don't mind, we're going to have some very tasty looking pieces of chicken. So until next time. As you can see from the building behind me here, every once in a while they need to be renovated. So it's across to the studio now where Phil Parker is going to talk us through scribing some stone walling. Sometimes we need wall finishes for our model buildings that aren't available as plastic card or cardboard. This is a Petite Properties cottage kit and it's supplied as a series of laser cut MDF parts. You glue them together and it produces a building full of character but utterly flat. So what I had to do was I had to produce plaster stonework and I'm going to show you how I did that. Before you crack on with scribing walls for your building, it's a good idea, and it's certainly something I did when I built the cottages, to do a little test piece to get your hand in and work out where any potential problems are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to step you through this and show you how I made this little wall here. Now there's quite a lot of steps to this. So since many of them actually require to leave things overnight, I've done this Blue Peter style with an awful lot of, look, here's one I did earlier. 
what I've done is I've got a load of pieces of MDF just like the kit and uh, we're going to work on those. The first stage is to paint the MDF with PVA glue. This seals the material and also gives the plaster something to stick to. Now, I'll be honest, you don't need very good PVA for this. I'm using some stuff I got from the pound store um, as it's just the right mix of runny and sticky. And all you do is work it over with a brush. Make sure you cover as much of the surface as you're going to put plaster on. And then, then leave it alone to dry overnight. Now this is what it looks like when it's dried and it's ready for the plaster. The plaster needs to be any cheap all-purpose wall filler you can find. Um, apparently the cheap stuff is actually better than the really good stuff. I'm told. Now I've mixed this up and the recommended consistency is the same as ricotta cheese. I'm a cheddar man myself so the advice that uh, thick whipped cream um, seems to be about the right consistency. Uh, thinner is better than thicker because it dries stronger. All you do, scoop a nice bit of um, plaster onto the MDF sheet. You can see it's sticking to the uh, PVA and once you've got plenty of plaster on, smear it around with a knife. Now this is, a, this is an artist's palette knife which is ideal for the job, but any knife will do to be honest. If you know anybody who does cake decoration, they'll be really good at this step and can give you a nice thin layer. You're going to be looking for a layer at le um, about a millimetre thick, but the next stage will sort this out. The plaster needs to dry thoroughly overnight before you move on to the next stage. Now, unless you're exceptionally good at smearing this stuff around, you'll notice that it's actually gone lumpy bumpy, it's thick in places and uh, thin in others. That's not a problem because what you need is a sanding block. Just give the whole surface a really good sand to bring it all down nice and flat. And there we are. A nice smooth surface. It doesn't need to be perfect for stonework but you do want it reasonably smooth. You've now created an awful lot of dust so get the vacuum cleaner out, clean up and then we'll move on to engraving some stones. The first step for engraving the stones is to mark out and then scribe the horizontal courses. Now what I've done is instead of sitting there with a, a ruler and carefully measuring everything I've made myself a little rule which has got marks for my courses on it and I'm using that as my guide so that all the uh, stones end up the right sort of height and I'm just marking them with pencil on the directly onto the plaster work. And as you can see it's a lot quicker to copy the uh, marks on my bit of cardboard than it would be to be sitting there with a steel rule trying to measure everything. Scribing the uh, horizontal lines is really simple now. All I've got to do is join the dots up on either side of my test piece. And for that, I'll need a ruler and a scriber. This is a little pointed tool that came out of a really cheap set of jeweler's screwdrivers, the sort that you pay about three quid for. And it's just a sharp pointed tool, any sharp pointed tool, indeed even a small screwdriver would do for this stage. All you do, is drag the pointy tool along the ruler. Depending on how hard your plaster is, you may want to do a couple of runs and keep working your way down the, um, down the piece. If they're not deep enough, just run the uh, tool along again to deepen them up a bit. This is why you do a test piece to get the hang of this sort of thing. There we are. They don't need to be perfect because of course real stonework isn't exactly perfect level either. Okay, I'll now finish scribing all the horizontal lines and then move on to the verticals. All I do is scribe the vertical courses in, joining up the two horizontal courses with a tool. I'm doing this by eye and uh, it's slightly random, but then that's like how real stonework is anyway. Now, I know this looks awfully time consuming and indeed it is, but it's a really pleasant thing to do, quite therapeutic and a great way of whiling away a few hours. With all the stonework scribed, I've given it a coat of nice cream colour enamel 
and given it a bit of base color that way. And then I've picked out individual stones in a slightly darker color. Now you can really go to town picking out individual stones and producing a lot of variety of colors within your stonework. Um, I've done it fairly quickly because this is just a test piece. However, this isn't quite the end of the process because as you can see, the colors are really quite stark. So there's one more step to give a bit of color to this and bring everything together. To apply the uh, paint just to the surface of the stonework, don't use a brush, use a little bit of sponge. Pick the uh, paint up off the lid, dab, little, dab the excess off on the uh, woodwork, and then it's ready for the stone. Dab the paint on the surface, and you can see it gradually tones down the picked out stones and gives a bit more color to the um, other ones. Now, the beauty of this, this also gives you a little bit of texture when you're working it with the uh, sponge, and so that'll increase the texture on your stonework, which is the effect we're looking for. Once the uh, extra paint has dried, really let it dry. Um, the finishing touch is to give the entire building a wash of a dark brown color that will sit in all the uh, courses, and that's what I've done on the cottage, and as you can see, it's quite effective. Amongst other things, the Seven Valley Railway also offer driver experience courses. So I'm here with a familiar face, Phil Parker, and we're going to take this locomotive out for a spin with Kev and Kian. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Shall we get on board? Yeah, <laughs> come on board. Yeah, anyway. <coughs> that are important to have sound, model railways are too. 
So it's over to Ben now to talk a little bit about DCC sound. Hello, I'm Keith Pearson, also known as Mr. Sound Guy. I do sound chips for mobile railway engines and the reason I've got into this uh, line of business is that years ago I was a software test engineer. Uh, I've always liked computers, I've always liked uh, mobile railways, so what better way to mix the two than to create sound projects for mobile railway engines. The main difference is the way that the uh, sound behaves. In other words, the way that the sound and the locomotive move uh, in relation to each other. Uh, these are very prototypical in that they're uh, possible to recreate without pressing any buttons whatsoever, just on the throttle, various scenarios that exist in real life. Uh, the most obvious one being coasting, where the engine is still moving at speed, uh, but the engine sound is actually idling. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to show you is the coasting feature. Now to do that obviously we need to get the locomotive moving. So I'm going to do that now, open the throttle quite a long way, engine revs up, starts to move off, the revs are in advance uh, of the actual motion as per the prototype. And once it gets going uh, we shall demonstrate the um, coasting feature. As I say, everything is done on the throttle, no buttons at all apart from the brake button which we'll see in a moment. So she's moving now, um, so what I'm going to do next when she comes round here is literally put the throttle down to zero and you'll hear the engine notch down. But the actual locomotive is keeping going as per the rail thing. And it will keep going for quite a long time. I think uh, one of the tests I did for Helgen Class 26 running at speed step 128 took a scale mile to come to a halt. So to bring it round into the station I'm going to open the throttle once again. Uh, engine revs up. Speed still going. I'm going to demonstrate how to stop the engine just there. First thing obviously is to bring the throttle down to zero and you will hear the engine immediately shuts down uh, to the idling speed. Uh, but the engine as you can probably see uh, is still going and it will go for quite a long time. So to bring it to a halt you need to apply the brake, which I've got on F4. If you put the brakes on and leave them on like that, it comes to a nice, gentle stop. With a subtle brake squeal at the end there. Okay, one of the problems with the uh, sound chips in general is that the, the architecture is fixed, obviously. But in real life there are a million and one different scenarios such as revving up and moving slowly. With Mr Sound Guy what I've tried to do is keep it as prototypical as possible and have everything literally driven by the throttle as you would in real life. So I'm going to demonstrate now a couple of real life scenarios that you might want to recreate. Imagine uh, you've brought your train into the terminus station, the station pilot has taken the carriages away. So now all you want to do is move the engine uh, along the platform to the other end with a, a slight blip of throttle. And the way to do that on this class 50 is just open the throttle to speed step uh, 23, say. Uh, and the engine will rev up and then when it gets to target speed it'll drop back down so you can go go the rest of the way along the platform with the engine just idling as it is now 
Now, the other thing is you might want to move along without revving the engine up at all. Well, that's easy. All you need to do is just gently open the throttle step by step. And you can see now the engine is slowly crawling. Um, there's no uh, increase in the idling speed at all. Again, bring it to a halt. Put the brakes on. So the only concession I've had really uh, to, to the use of function buttons is one for the brake, uh, which obviously is a necessity because with the coasting, uh, without the brake you wouldn't be able to stop the engine in a controlled manner exactly where you want to. Okay, we have the same uh, idea applied to a steam engine, though obviously with steam engines there's less variation in the sound uh, compared to a diesel. But you still have uh, the coasting sound, which on this uh, O1 is uh, rod clank, and you still have two levels of intensity of chuff, uh, which I'll demonstrate now. That hissing sound you hear at the beginning is the automatic sound of the drain cocks. That comes on automatically uh, if the engine has been stationary for 25 seconds or longer. So I'll get it up to a, a medium speed and then demonstrate the coasting and get it to stop somewhere in the middle over there. Uh, as per the diesels, we have all the other sounds on these decoders, uh, such as coal shoveling, which is this one. The fireman will shovel for as long as the button is pressed, so we'll give him a rest. And having put some coal in the firebox, we now need to put some water in the boiler, so open the injector and again I'm going to bring it to a halt over at the end of the siding up there there we go Okay, uh, just to finish off the demo then, we have a diesel mechanical. Now, this is a, a WM rail bus. I recorded the sound for this from the North Norfolk Railway. Uh, it's a diesel mechanical, so it has a gearbox and you'll hear the gears changing as it accelerates. And also, in common with many diesel mechanical heritage units, it has a freewheeling gearbox. Okay, so um, ordinarily, Turning the sound on, you will get a false start on this particular model. I'm going to open the throttle now and then get, get this one moving. Okay, so... Sliding doors opening. Yards whistle. Communication buzzers. And off we go. So there we are, uh, into second gear. Nicely uh, accelerating away there. Yep, third gear, and we're well on our way now. So go around the circuit, and then I shall shut the throttle so the unit will free wheel as per the prototype. And then, as with all the other ones, I'll um, put the brake on uh, and uh, demonstrate how to bring it to a, a halt. Okay, so if you want to know more about what the sounds are on each of the sound projects, visit the website mrsoundguy.co.uk.
The website is being updated all the time, so if you can't find anything on there, feel free to drop me an email and I shall let you know what the current status is. The Seven Valley Railway, like many preserved lines, certainly has a fair collection of wagons that in need of restoration, just like this one here. And it certainly hasn't seen a lick of paint in quite a few years, as you can see by the rust. But sometimes with models, we don't actually want to have the paint on them. So it's over to the studio now, where Phil Parker is going to show an innovative product that does just that, stripping paint. Over the last few months, we've been running a series in BRM called Secondhand Saviours, where I've been taking junk, essentially, found on secondhand stores at shows and trying to turn it into halfway decent models you'd be proud to have on your layout. One of the problems with a lot of wagons you'll find on these stands is that they've been painted or weathered and really they look quite horrible. What can you do about that? Well, you're going to want to take the paint off and the first thing you might think of doing is heading out to the garage and ga grabbing yourself a can of paint stripper. With a plastic wagon, you really don't want to do that. And here's why. Now this tender has been partly stripped with domestic DIY store paint stripper. And as you can see, it's taken the paint off, but it's also started to melt the plastic underneath. And the whole thing's gone into a stringy mess that realistically is only fit for the bin. What you need for the job is a paint stripper specially formulated for use on plastic. And so today, we're gonna to try out just such a product, Deluxe Materials Strip Magic. Our test for today is gonna to be this somewhat badly weathered Hornby wagon. Don't worry, we can save it. Our tools for the job are Strip Magic, some old paint brushes, preferably some fairly stiff ones, uh, so that we can work the uh, strip magic into the uh, crevices. Um, normally I'd work over a sink, but a plastic pot will at least keep the chemicals on the table. Um, our wagon, and importantly, some rubber gloves. So let's get started. I'm just gonna place a dot of strip magic on the wagon and then watch as it does its job. The process of stripping the paint can take anything from 5 to 15 minutes, depending on the uh, wagons or the uh, plastics concerned. I find that Backman wagons take a lot longer than Hornby wagons in this instance. Right, the last job is to wash the strip magic off, and for that they recommend you use some alcohol. Uh, it doesn't mean dip it in a pint of beer. Um, I've got some alcohol from the uh, local chemist, just isopropyl alcohol, and dip the brush in it and wash off the paint and gunk hopefully leaving a nice clean wagon and then i'm just going to wipe off the rest with a piece of kitchen towel um, often if i'm working on a sink i'll actually give it a scrub with the toothbrush under some running water it's probably a good idea to remove the metal wheels when you do that Unfortunately, it's a grey plastic wagon that I've taken the grey paint off, but you can certainly see that it's dealt with all the weathering, and this, this wagon, once it's fully dry, is ready for a repaint. So there we have it. After only a few minutes' work, my previously badly weathered wagon is nearly as good as it when it was produced in the factory. Um, Strip Magic certainly has done its job, and definitely a better bet than using DIY paint stripper. Strip Magic is available from Deluxe Materials and many good hobby outlets. 
Well, as you can see, we had a great time here today at the Seven Valley Railway, and I certainly hope you enjoyed it as well. Don't forget, there's plenty more in the extras menu of the DVD, so make sure you take a look at that. Until next time, goodbye. Five to five, sun still shining. It's been a good day though, hasn't it? I think it? so, yes. I've enjoyed it, thoroughly enjoyed the, uh, the, the shoveling. Yeah. Um, even if I did miss the hole a few times. The guys on the foot plate were brilliant. They were friendly, they didn't push you around or make you think anything too serious. Yeah. Um, we had a good time and uh, you, you didn't feel like you didn't know something. No, that is true. I mean, there was always that sort of feeling that if anything was to go wrong, there's, there's a guy that's just behind you who's going to make everything go right, really, isn't there? I mean, I think there was never was... that sort of moment of trepidation where you're thinking, this could all go horribly wrong. No, you always felt confident, and I think you also felt you knew what you were doing because the guy was just saying, push this, pull that. Yeah. Uh, but he was explaining what it all did, so you did learn a bit as well. Yeah. And it, I mean, from, from what we saw, um, and if you take a look on the website as well, there's, there is a price for every sort of budget, really, on, on these driver courses. I mean, you just mentioning before the fact that if you get a group of about four passengers that go with one person who's on the footplate, it's about 20 quid a head for just the first session, isn't it? The, you know, the basic thing. So, And you get a ride up and down a beautiful railway yeah. in a single coach you're not even sharing with, oh, with, with, yeah. with crowds of people. Uh, it's a very economic way of having a great day out. Mm, yeah. Cracking present. I think, I think it's, it's been... It's been a fantastic day. I really enjoyed it. Thanks very much, guys. Well, 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 no problem. Glad you enjoyed it. Glad you enjoyed it. Come yes. back again. No, well, you're too fine. Enjoy this. <laughs> So if you'd like to book one of these tours, well, all you need to do is visit the Seven Valley Railway website or call the Kidderminster phone number. Anyway, I think you need to work on your coal shoveling skills because I must admit they weren't great. It's was... not a very big <laughs> hole to poke a very that, large, that's his um, excuse. Very that's large his shovel excuse. and loads of coal through. <laughs> yeah, I could definitely do with some more practice yeah. on that. So, uh, oh well, I should be saving up for my next birthday present. Definitely.